Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Have History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and this video will actually complete the second day at Gettysburg. I'll be putting those all into one big video and releasing it very soon. So, without any further ado, here's the battle for Little Round Top, Devil's Den, and the Wheat Field. Throughout the night of July 1st and into the morning of July 2nd, Meade's army reinforced itself and began throwing up fortifications. Confederate soldiers commented that they could hear the Union soldiers' axes at work all night like a bunch of beavers. Lee likewise reinforced his position, mimicking the fishhook formation of the Union army. After a circuitous route to the Confederate right, Longstreet delayed attacking the Union left as ordered by Lee. Union General Daniel Sickles, not comfortable with the swampy area he occupied, ordered his divisions forward to take advantage of some high ground in his front against his commanding general's orders. This left Sickles' corps unsupported in front of the main Union line, a prime target for the Confederates of James Longstreet to launch their attack. Lee wanted an in echelon attack where brigade after brigade would engage in succession attempting to roll up the Union line. Brigadier General Vander Law's brigade was on the far right of the Confederate line, with Brigadier General Jerome Robertson's brigade to his left. Their division commander, Major General John Bell Hood, ordered Robertson to keep in contact with the Emmitsburg Road and swing to the left, keeping in contact with Law's left. When they stepped off for the attack, Law's brigade moved far to the right, opening up a large gap between the two brigades. The two Texas regiments on the far right of Robertson's line knew they had to keep in contact with Law, and Law saw the gap widening, so both attempted to rectify the situation. Law moved his rightmost regiments to the left to deal with the artillery in front of Ward's brigade and to fill the gap, and the two Texas regiments followed the rest of Law's brigade going to the right. This left Robertson with only two regiments to attack Hobart Ward's line, positioned on Hoax Ridge. Law pushed the second United States sharpshooters back as he advanced, and Ward, seeing the threat to his left, sent the 4th Maine into the valley created between Devil's Den and Little Round Top. The 3rd Arkansas made contact with Ward's line first. The lone regiment could not stand the musketry of the enemy alone, and when the Union regiments advanced, the Arkansans fell back to a defensive position. The 15th and 47th Alabama went against orders and fought the sharpshooters to the top of Big Round Top, leaving Law to command only one regiment of his brigade and two regiments of Robertson's. The 44th and 48th Alabama were now operating independently. The heavy fighting at the southern end of the battlefield drew more units to the location. The 17th Maine from De Trobriand's brigade moved through the wheat field to the flank of the 3rd Arkansas, and Benning's Georgians marched in support of Law and Robertson. The Texans and Alabamians on the right continued their ascent to the top of a little round top to gain the high ground. The 1st Texas was determined to turn the flank of Ward's line and launched a vigorous attack. They outnumbered the 124th New York and hoped the way of their numbers would allow them to turn the flank. However, the New Yorkers were ready and launched their own attack and drove the Texans back about 200 yards. Now, however, the New Yorkers were in an exposed position in their attempt to protect their flank and the artillery on their left. About this time, Colonel Strong Vincent's brigade arrived at Little Round Top. The men formed a sort of half circle around the top of the hill and began piling up limbs and rocks to help protect themselves from the advancing enemy. The 44th Alabama advanced on the 4th Maine but the musketry from the Union troops stalled their attack, so they hunkered down around some boulders. The 48th Alabama also advanced against the men from Maine. Because of the terrain, the two regiments didn't fully see one another until they were just 60 feet apart. From that distance, they flung lead at one another, but the Maine men didn't budge. They held their ground and forced the Alabamians back. On Little Round Top, Vincent's brigade did not arrive a moment too soon. One Union soldier commented, that within five minutes, the Alabamians and Texans would have occupied their location. The Confederates attacked Vincent's men atop the hill, but the men from the 83rd Pennsylvania and the 44th New York delivered a terrifying volley into the gray troops. The Southerners pulled back to the base of the hill to regroup. Meanwhile, Law was attempting to put his brigade back together. The 47th and 15th Alabama still remained on Big Round Top, but were quickly recalled. The 47th descended Big Round Top first, making the way down the tree-covered hill and into the valley between the two hills. The 15th followed behind. Also, Lieutenant Charles Hazlitt's 5th United States Battery D arrived on the field. At first, he was hesitant to place his artillery on the little round top, but he decided that if the position was not held, his artillery would be no good anyway. 
so his guns began ascending the hill. It would take a while for all of the guns to make it to the top because of the rough terrain, but the advantage of having the high ground to rain shot and shell over the enemy made it a good location. By that time, the 47th Alabama charged up the hill and collided with the 83rd Pennsylvania and the 20th Maine. Along parts of the line, hand-to-hand -hand fighting broke out between the two sides, but the climb and fighting was too much for the 47th, and they pulled back down the hill. Along parts of the line, hand-to-hand -hand fighting broke out between the two sides, but the climb and fighting was too much for the 47th, and they pulled back down the hill. The 15th Alabama was close on the tail of the 47th, but couldn't deliver much help in the 47th's assault. However, they did make their own attack to the far left flank of Vincent's line, held by the 20th Maine. They made multiple assaults and even made the leftmost companies of Joshua Chamberlain's 20th Maine buckle under the destructive fire of musketry, but they were eventually thrown back as well. At Devil's Den and Hoax Ridge, the fighting had come to a standstill, with each side hiding behind large rocks in the area. However, the tide was turning as more troops were coming to their respective sides rescue. The 40th New York and 6th New Jersey were marching south. The Trobriand's brigade made it to the field, and Benning's Georgians were on their way to deliver a devastating attack to break the lull in the combat. The weight of the Confederate numbers in the sector began to show as the Georgians added more regiments to the beleaguered Confederate line. Ward sent the 99th Pennsylvania to the left to help hold against the Confederate attack, where attack and counterattack left dead and wounded strewn all over the rock-covered ground. The 4th Maine also joined in to help hold the line, but adding to the Union's woes was the fact that more Southern brigades were on their way to the scene of the carnage. A charge by the 40th New York held off Benning's Georgians and the 48th Alabama for a few moments, but it was too late to recover the ground now. Ward's line melted away, freeing up the 48th Alabama to attack Little Round Top with the rest of their brigade. Law's brigade, along with the Texas regiments, made repeated attacks against the Union Brigade perched atop Little Round Top. During this attack, the 4th Alabama began to give way, which opened up the flanks of the 5th Texas and 47th Alabama to musketry from the New Yorkers and Pennsylvanians. The 15th Alabama attempted to swing around the flank of the 20th Maine as this was transpiring. On the right of the line, the 16th Michigan began to give way. Colonel Vincent defiantly stood on the rocky outcrop and urging his men to stay when a Confederate bullet mortally wounded him in the groin. Colonel Rice took over command of the brigade. As the Michiganders pulled back, the 140th New York, urged there by Brigadier General Governor K. Warren, took their spot and sent back the attacking Southerners. All along the line, lead flew through the air and men fought with their fists and used their rifled muskets as clubs. On the far left of the Union line, the 20th Maine, running low on ammunition, surged forward with fixed bayonets, sending the 15th Alabama reeling and capturing a great many of them on the slopes of the hill. With that, Law's brigade pulled back, leaving Little Round Top in the hands of the Federals. Vincent's brigade would get more reinforcements in the form of Brigadier General Weed's brigade. Weed himself would be mortally wounded, most likely by a sharpshooter in Devil's Den, and command would go to Colonel Kenner Garrard. However, the fight was not over. To the west, George Anderson's Georgians were fighting Regis de Trobriand's brigade to a standstill. Neither side could overpower the other, so both waited on reinforcements which quickly came. Colonel Tilton and Colonel Schweitzer's brigade arrived from the 5th Corps to help bolster de Trobriand's line, but Brigadier General Kershaw's brigade from McClaw's division was approaching the field to help Anderson. When the South Carolinians arrived, Kershaw had to divide his force, with Park going north to fight Union forces in the Peach Orchard, leaving only three regiments to help Anderson with the 15th South Carolina having a longer march to get to the location. Tilton, who had not commanded a brigade in combat before, thought his position untenable and told his division commander, who ordered his brigade to withdraw. Members of the 118th Pennsylvania yelled, no retreat, we're on our own soil, but it was no use. The other members of the brigade were now leaving, and the Pennsylvanians, as well as the rest of the regiments in that sector, began to pull back. The Georgians and South Carolinians were exhausted trying to take Stony Hill and the wheat field, but before they could capitalize on the federal withdrawal, four Union brigades made it to the field. Major General Winfield Scott Hancock, getting word about the dire situation to the south, dispatched Brigadier General John Caldwell's entire division to suppress the Confederate attack. The brigades of Zook and Cross entered the wheat field and Stony Hill area with Kelly's Irish Brigade in support and Brooks Brigade in reserve, but Confederate soldiers hid behind every rock and tree, peppering their line with lead. To stand was suicide, to retreat was unthinkable, so the three brigades advanced toward the Confederates. 
some enemy lines not more than 30 paces away from one another when they fired their volleys. Cross's brigade outflanked Anderson's right, but the right side of Cross's line took heavy damage, forcing them to stand and fight instead of advance. Kershaw's two regiments were holding on for dear life, but when Caldwell ordered forward Brooks' brigade, the tide solidly turned in favor of the Union. However, now Brooks' brigade outran its support and any assurance that its flanks would be secured. Additionally, Wofford's brigade of Georgians appeared on the north side of the field, moving quickly to the Union right flank. To the north, Barksdale's Mississippians and the other brigades of Lafayette McClaws' division, as well as portions of Anderson's division of Hill's Corps, continued the in echelon assault on the Union lines, heading for Cemetery Ridge. The Union soldiers of Caldwell's division had made a beautiful and successful advance, but could not hold on to the ground they fought so tenaciously to take. The Federal brigades began to fall back through Rose Woods and the wheat field, over the dead and wounded strewn throughout that sector. Switzer's brigade was ordered into the wheat field to stymie the Confederate advance. Plus, the brigades of Burbank and Day arrived in the valley between Devil's Den and Little Round Top. Switzer's men were hit with small arms fire that thinned the ranks, and with their comrades retreating around them, they fell back to relative safety. Burbank did not know what awaited him in his front as he marched his men forward. When the blue troops cleared his front, Burbank sent his men into the wheat field, not aware of the approaching southerners from three sides. The blast of rifle fire seemed to come from all around them, and the brigade took an incredible amount of casualties. The 7th, 10th, and 17th U.S. regulars lost about 50% of their men in the short amount of time that they stayed in the wheat field. Burbank and Day's brigades were pulled back behind the Union forces on Little Round Top. By this point, the brigades of Kershaw, Sims, and Anderson were basically an armed mob. Officers attempted to separate their regiments from those of others, but it was useless. To the north, Confederate forces were attacking Cemetery Hill and Culp's Hill as the sun was setting and darkness began to cover the battlefield. On this part of the field, there would also be an attack at this late hour. Reinforcements from the 5th and 6th Corps arrived at Little Round Top to help secure the Union Army's left. Wofford's brigade and the rest of the Confederates advanced toward Little Round Top even though it bristled with Union infantry and artillery. Lieutenant Aaron Walcott's artillery blasted holes in Wofford's brigade but were too far forward and the men had to spike and abandon the guns. Nevin and McCandless's brigades dashed off the hill to meet them. The fighting was quick but decisive. Too tired from the evening engagement, with their ranks horribly depleted, the Southerners fell back to safety. First Corps Commander James Longstreet saw the futility in issuing any more orders to attack the location and called off any further action. The battle on the southern end of the field on this second day of the engagement was over, but there was more fighting to the north.